Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. I'd like to welcome our online audiences and those of you who listen to this later. Uh, this is one in a long series of uh, live stream interviews, which we do with authors that we've been doing in particular uh, since the COVID crisis started and our place was shut down. Now we're looking forward in a couple of months to opening up our live audiences again, but I'm sure we'll be using more live stream than we did before because it's been a great success and thanks for all your interest. So today uh, we have Mustafa Akiola, uh, the author of several books, uh, but we're going to be speaking about Reopening Muslim Minds, his latest book. Um, it is uh, a great look at the history of when reason, tolerance, and freedom thrived and when it didn't thrive in history. And uh, I think it's a, a eye-opening to many people who haven't studied anything about that history um, because there are plenty of times when uh, Islamic society was way ahead of the European society uh, in each of those issues. So thank you very much for joining us, uh, Mustafa. Um, and go ahead, tell us a little bit about what made you do this book. Sure. I mean, what, what made you go into this, this part of the theory? Uh, sure. George, thank you so much, first of all, for uh, kindly hosting me here and to you and the Commonwealth Club. Uh, I, uh, I begin the story of the book in the introduction chapter, telling about my experience in Malaysia in 2017 of first giving a public lecture that Islam should be based on freedom and not coercion, and people should not be uh, monitored or checked by the religion police, and then getting arrested by the religion police <laughs> for saying that. <laughs> Uh, luckily, it was a short arrest. It was, you know, 18 hours, thanks to some diplomatic, uh, you know, work behind the scenes, which I also explain in the book a little bit. But this is just a glimpse of a problem I see in the contemporary Muslim world. Not all Muslim majority countries. I mean, there are today Muslim majority countries like Bosnia, Herzegovina or Albania, which are quite free and, and open and liberal and, and people are pious or not pious and it's their free choice and that's what it should be. But we have pretty authoritarian regimes uh, justifying themselves through religious arguments and also core, using coercive methods to keep society conservative. That's mm -hmm. why you have religion police in Saudi Arabia. You have in Iran, I mean, going after religion police, forcing women to cover their headscarves. You know, I mean, where their headscarves cover their head. By the way, I'm critical of the efforts to make women take their headscarves off as well, which we sometimes <laughs> see in France and some European countries. I think that's another yeah. problem on the other side of the uh, spectrum. Also coercive, yeah. Yeah, that's coercive as well. I mean, I'm, my, my always uh, argument is that let women decide what they will wear. That can be mm -hmm. something very conservative. That can be something not conservative. It's their choice mm -hmm. and we should respect. Um, and we have these problems and uh, illiberal interpretations of Islam. In Pakistan, there are blasphemy laws. I mean, mm -hmm. if you say something critical about Prophet Muhammad, I wouldn't say as a Muslim myself, but somebody can say, or even people are sometimes falsely blamed for saying something offensive and they're arrested every month, almost something like that happens in Pakistan. Sometimes mobs attack that person and you know they live under threat. So there is this illiberal authoritarian interpretation of Islam, which is creating problems uh, in the world for human rights. And as a Muslim myself, I think it is overshadowing the brighter values in my faith tradition. Mm -hmm. so, and this is not a problem that only Islam has faced. I mean, I, I also underline that. I mean, if you mm -hmm. went back four centuries ago, Actually, Islamic world was quite tolerant generally compared to the Christendom of the time. That's why when Jews were persecuted in Spain, they fled to the Ottoman Empire. But Christianity changed with the Enlightenment, with thinkers like John Locke or Pierre Bale, saying that you know religion should be based on free conscience and and you know states should not coerce, states should not uphold one sect over the other, one church that gave the U.S. Constitution, you know, the idea of civil rights, religious freedom, and so on and so forth. We haven't in the Muslim world fully made that transformation, that, mm -hmm. that, that conscious decision to give up course of power, as I call it. And I'm saying we have an issue here. We have to deal with this. And 
here is the situation. Why we have, you know, course of power? Because Islam was articulated under hegemonic imperial states mm-hmm. in the first centuries. Uh, they had blasphemy laws to sometimes kill their own critics. And mm-hmm. by the way, the Sasanids and the Byzantine empires were doing the same thing at the time. It, there was, there's, right. there's nothing sacred in this. We can outgrow this. So that is the basic argument in the book. And when I say reopening Muslim minds, what I mean is that we had actually very interesting theological insights in early Islam, which mm-hmm. could actually prevent this you know, authoritarianism or help us today to rethink some of these issues. And that's why I'm saying, let's go back and rethink what Ibn Rushd was saying uh, about yeah. Sharia. Let's go and uh, see these debates between the Mutezlites and the Asharites about ethics and, and law. Uh, let, so th- that is what I mean by reopening. And by the way, I think the book also is an effort to reopen non-Muslim minds as well. Mm-hmm. Because at the same time, I'm showing that Europeans or Westerners who are saying, oh, we had the enlightenment, we had beautiful human rights, and others didn't know that. I'm saying, <laughs> no, no, actually, you got some ideas from us too. So there is an interaction right. between civilizations, and there might be better or worse times of any civilization. So we learned from each other, and we should keep learning that. So it is an effort to show some uncultivated seeds of freedom and reason in Islam, as I call it. Uh, and to you know, make this argument more public. To uh, I use a lot of academic sources, scholarly uh, insights, let's say, mm-hmm. but I try to put them in an accessible way that everybody who's interested in this discussion can relate. And you succeeded. It's, it's very accessible. Thank you. So it, it, <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, uh, great. Great the, to hear that. Uh, just for context, uh, we're going to only be speaking about the issue uh, in Muslim uh, countries. But this issue is, is not just even a religious issue, but a political one as well. I mean, I'm sure Karl Marx does not feel that every person who said they're communist has, you know, been doing it in an open and tolerant, uh, you know, way that was trying to accomplish what, what he had in mind. Um, mm-hmm. uh, one of my favorite uh, anonymous sayings is an idea is not responsible for the people who believe in it. Um, so, so you have an idea, you put it forward, and then, and then people uh, apply it. And the, this position you're talking about, the reasonable tolerance, we, we can allow freedom, is the minority position, has always been the minority position. And it might look not like that in the West at a certain, in the last 100 years or something like that. But it's, it's even now. I mean, our own society is, mm-hmm. is undergoing all kinds of people yelling at each other and telling you you, you, you mm-hmm. can't have done that. This Puritan impulse to just tell everybody else what to do is universal, I think, in, 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 ter- in humanity. Yeah, it is. And uh, it can be manifested in all sorts of ways. I mean, it's self-righteousness can be religious. It can be ideological. It can mm-hmm. be racial. You know, uh, right. our group is the right chosen, the self right, the righteous one. And others are heretics, infidels evil people that has to be silenced or eradicated. I mean, that impulse, unfortunately, is a part of human history. And we have seen it in all ways. I mean, right. I mean, you mentioned Marx, of course, Marx wasn't calling for maybe people put to put in gulags, but Stalin did, right. Or Khmer Rouge committed genocide in Cambodia against more than 2 million people just because they didn't align with the party. So a lot of horrible things have happened in history. And I'm not as, like some people who see, who see, oh my God, religions are a problem and we should secularize the world. Well, we've seen the secular world and some bad things have racism. You know, mm-hmm. these are new modern ideas. I mean, Nazism was not a religious idea, but it was mm-hmm. a supposedly scientific, you know, pseudo scientific idea. Uh, but I do value uh, universalism. So that's one mm-hmm. emphasis I, I put in the book. And here's something interesting. If you look at the Muslim world today, if you look at intra-Muslim conversations, which I've had, you know, as a Muslim myself in mm-hmm. my home country, Turkey, or around the uh, Ummah, let's say the Muslim world, there's there's a very often there's very often a yearning, a you know, nostalgia for the greatness of Islam. Oh, mm-hmm. a thousand years ago, Islam was the most vibrant and creative civilization on earth, which is mm-hmm. true. I mean, especially compared to Christendom. I mean, mm-hmm. a thousand years ago, the biggest scientists were coming out of the Muslim world. Mm-hmm. And some of their inventions made their way, way into the West, by the way. That's why mm-hmm. algorithm comes from al-Kharazmi, <laughs> or right. algebra comes from al-Jabir, which is Arabic. So there was, there was this time that Islamic world was more creative, more economically successful. Muslim cities were more polished. 
Uh, Muslims were great in medicine. Ibn Sina, mm -hmm. you know, the great Avicenna, as he's known, mm -hmm. was the pioneer in, in world uh, medicine. But that era gradually faded and Muslim mm -hmm. world didn't maybe decline, but stagnated. And ultimately with the coming of modernity, which also came through colonialism, which was another trauma, of course, mm -hmm. Muslim world got shocked and responded in different ways. And one was radicalism and fundamentalism, which is still haunting us, of course. Now I'm asking a question here. Why were we great a thousand years ago? <laughs> <laughs> and one answer you might find in some mosques or some conservative circles that we were great because we were pious and God mm. blessed us with victory. And when we turned sinful, God punished us. So you explain history through the dynamics of sin and piety, right? So that's, mm. that's one explanation. Another explanation says we were very austere and we just looked into the Quran and when we got you know, confused with other thoughts, uh, we, we, we turned um, wrongful. I mean, Sayyid Qutb says that. I mean, he says we, we, we were corrupted by Greek philosophy. Yeah. I'm saying quite the contrary. <laughs> we were great because we were cosmopolitan, because we were open minded. We being Muslims, mm -hmm. we were great because uh, Muslims in the early Abbasid Empire, I mean, didn't shy away from learning something from Plato or Aristotle. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and developing that too. They just didn't copy it. But Islam found Greek wisdom, which was preserved in uh, Christian churches in the East, not in the West. The West was not a very mm -hmm. open-minded place at the time. Yep. They translated them. It's the world's greatest, one of the greatest intellectual efforts. I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with this, right. uh, given your work on Socrates. They interpreted this, they translated it, they developed the, these ideas, they corrected some even ideas that were there in terms of science. But the point was, Muslims didn't say these people are kafir, that is infidel. Mm -hmm. you, I mean, because wisdom was universal and that include ethical wisdom as well. Mm -hmm. Whereas gradually another theological dogma came to the scene, which said, no, wisdom just comes from revelation, which is mm -hmm. our religion. Whereas what I'm arguing is that, well, revelation itself actually gave us a universalistic wisdom. So, mm -hmm. so the fact that you believe in revelation doesn't make you a blind literalist, but that interpretation came to the scene. How that happened is a long history. There are different theories in that. I entertained it in the book. But ultimately mm -hmm. today, the, the, the result today is that you will, when you have conversations in Pakistan with some conservative clerics saying that you shouldn't kill people for some offensive words, because that is against human rights. And they will say, what is human rights? That's nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are they will not relate to anything that is universal. That is the universal declaration. Of that wouldn't mean anything. So right. this is, you know, what scholars call epistemology. Like how do you, what's your theory of knowledge? And I think a closing of minds have taken place because of Asharism, a theological perspe perspective I criticize a lot. And also others like Salafism. It, it was called Ahli Hadith at the time. It's today called Salafism. But basically they said all wisdom we need is, is in the Sharia. Uh, mm -hmm. all ethical wisdom. And when you say that you are uh, going to stagnate and this is exactly mm -hmm. what happened. Mm -hmm. And you will not be able to distinguish between the fact that the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him did certain things because it was his culture and it was the norms of the time. Mm -hmm. And you will not be able to distinguish between those because you don't have that critical, critical outlook. Mm -hmm. And in the book, I'm showing how this happened what are the impacts of that in, in the contemporary Muslim world today and how we can rethink these issues by still being good Muslims, mm -hmm. uh, by not being abandoned our faith, but understanding that we should articulate and live this faith in freedom and not coercion and, and with tolerance to uh, other faiths, other minorities, heretics, infidels, mm -hmm. uh, and people who might have offensive words, which will not like and you know be happy with, but we can turn away in a civilized way. Yeah, we're, we're, we're sitting here uh, in the 21st century uh, and we have five, six major cultures. Islamic culture is, is uh, almost a billion people, right? Something like that. Yeah. More, um, more. More than One, a billion. 1.5 or 6 billion, I think, yeah. 1.5 or 6 billion. I, yeah. I'm, still, I'm still going from my youth when it, there were only <laughs> 3 billion people all together. Yeah, population's <laughs> changed. In these, Keeps yes. growing. Uh, and then, then we have China, which is almost the same number of people yeah. with the Confucian culture. We have India with its Hindu culture and, and also the Muslim culture that was there. And, and then others. And if we're going to get together, 
you know, there's a common ground and the common ground is, is from this openness tolerance. And uh, it seems to me, especially because the times uh, that were very successful in Islamic culture, um, the times that people were the most open, most tolerant were the times that they were most successful and confident. They were on top of things. They, they were the majority. They were the culture that had succeeded. The United States was most tolerant after World War II, you know, for the next 20, 30 years, because it was on top of the world. The British Empire at a certain point was the most tolerant, took down slavery, that, that kind of stuff, after having been, you know, a colonializer. But yeah. they got so confident that they could do something. Rome was confident at certain points. And Islamic culture was confident. So the, the, the Baghdad period, uh, why don't you tell a little bit about that, the, the House of Wisdom. Um, you mentioned the, their, their approach. But why don't you also talk about this urethro uh, dilemma that you uh, mentioned in your book um, as something that, that was discussed because they took it out of Plato's thing and then mm -hmm. applied it to mm -hmm. Islam. It was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, Baghdad was, of course, uh, created out of scratch, you know, by the early Abbasid uh, caliphs as a new capital. I mean, before that, the capital of the Muslim empire under the Umayyads was Damascus. But then, you know, there was a coup, a bloody one against the Umayyads. And there, the, these the Abbasids uh, were established in Iraq. And they, from Kufa, they created Baghdad. And it was... Even its design came from Euclid, you know, inspired. It was like a, mm -hmm. a perfect square and, you know, its dimensions were calculated. It shows, and of course, one of the great uh, caliphs of the time, uh, uh, El Ma'mun, I mean, he had a bad policy of suppressing critics. So I'll, I'll not support everything he did, but mm -hmm. he saw Aristotle in his dream and, you know, like an Aristotle and Prophet Muhammad were two sources of wisdom. So there was this very interesting cosmopolitan idea. And so, and it has theological roots to it, uh, mm -hmm. which is reflected in the school called Mutezila. Uh, now, Mutezila is pushed aside in Islamic history as a kind of heretical movement, but I think they were not heretical. Second, I think they had some influence in mainstream Sunni Islam too, which needs to be again revived. Now, I'll come to the real qu question you ask. I mean, I have a chapter, Islam's Eurofro Dilemma, mm -hmm. which is, I think, is a key issue that we Muslims need to discuss today. Uh, of course, it, I mean, you're, you're author on Socrates, you know, uh, the Eurofro Dilemma goes back to Socrates, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and Socrates was having a conversation with this guy named Eurofro in Athens, and Socrates asked, what is piety? And, you know, Eurofro said, piety is what gods love. And Socrates asked, do gods love it, love someone because he's pious or does he become pious because gods love him? I mean, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. Now, this, this dilemma was reflected in Christianity too and also in Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is two different ways of looking into divine commandments. One is mm -hmm. to say, God says, do not murder, right? That's in the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. One way is to say murder is wrong, ethically wrong, objectively wrong. It's obviously wrong. And God mm -hmm. is telling us not to do this. Mm -hmm. So even if God didn't tell us, we could know this through conscience mm -hmm. and reason. And reason and conscience were used sometimes interchangeably in early Islam. But God is also ex you know, additionally reminding us. Mm -hmm. If you think like this, you can say, well, even people who don't have our religion might have some ethical knowledge because it's in human nature. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why maybe Aristotle has some good ideas on ethics, which he, you know, he had a book on that, which influenced right. Muslim thinkers at the time. And the other way of looking at this is to say, murder is wrong simply because God said so. Uh, if he said it's right, it would be right. Because right. there is no source of ethics other than the commandments of God, which is called divine command theory, you know, in philosophy. Mm -hmm. Now, I show in my book that in Islam, there were these two approaches, but the divine command theory supported by the Hanbalites and the Asharites dominated Sunni Islamic thinking, which had the consequences that I'm describing, which is, mm -hmm. If, if Sharia defines what is right and wrong, then there is no value outside of it. First of all, there is no way to reinterpret what the Sharia says, because what ground do you have to look, you know, to question mm -hmm. things? Uh, on, for example, on women's issues. I mean, I show how this ex ex shows in issues relating to women's rights in the Muslim world today. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, it's established in the Sharia, which is rooted in, in a verse in the Quran, where, you know, men have more rights in inheritance than women. Mm -hmm. uh, now, 
if Sharia is your only source of ethical knowledge, you will say, we will implement this this way. Of course, men will have more rights because God said so. Mm -hmm. But if you have the, if you think outside of the divine command theory, you look into society and realize, well, women have the same responsibilities. There are a lot of single moms today. It's a different social structure. Maybe we should rethink why God said that. Then you will look back and say, oh, maybe God said that because in seventh century society, social conditions were like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so you will look at divine commands by looking into the context, by trying to understand his intention and re realizing that intention through different ways today. Mm -hmm. I show this, for example, on corporal punishments. Uh, there's a verse in the Quran, cut the hands of thieves, right? Amputate. Oh. And uh, they do that in Saudi Arabia. They do that in several countries in the Muslim world today. At least it's in the you know, penal code. Well, I'm saying, well, let's ask. I mean, does God have a special preference for corporal punishments compared to what we have in the modern world today, prisonment? I say, no, pre-Islamic Arabs were also doing the same thing. <laughs> and right. it was the norm of that society. There was no, there was no even prison in 7th century Mecca and Medina. Uh, so you made, a, you made a great point that that um, that they had no prisons and that the only way to know who was a thief. I mean, it's just like branding if people branded pirates later on. Uh, that was a Christian thing. Exactly. I mean, know. prison is a modern invent. I mean, you, it existed in pre-modern state. It's, prison needs a state without a state. I mean, in a tribal mm -hmm. society where you just have people living in tents and you don't in a nom nomads in a society, of nomads, you don't have prisons. So you have to if you need to punish someone and punishing people is necessary because they might c commit horrible crimes. You need something, and it was corporal punishments for a lot of, uh, for many centuries in human history, which is also in the Old Testament as well. So we can understand that God has an intention, which is to protect life and property from violent crime. Mm -hmm. But it, that intention was realized in the context of that era to which Islam was born. So this is what some theologians call distinguishing between what is historical and what is religious. Uh, there was, Islam was born into a history, a tribal mm -hmm. society where men were dominant, there were slaves, and Islam in most cases mitigated the problems in those societies. Mm -hmm. And we should understand the intention there, but we should not be blind literalists. But to be able to make this transformation, in the, I mean, this kind of interpretation in the first place, you need to have an ethical perspective, you know, that is... Right outside of the text itself. That's why I think uh, the, to move forward on some jurisprudential uh, deadlocks or like uh, uh, some kind of theological problems, you need to, uh, jurisprudential problems, you need to speak theology as well and uh, establish a more rational theology. Yeah, we can, we can look at it and say, um, historical setting and everything that the changes that were made in women's rights in the seventh century by Muhammad were an advance for oh, women. Yeah. And they were. And I think most people who look at it say that. But that doesn't mean that now to retreat back to those rules in, in a literal way is an advance. No, that's a retreat. You know? So fortunately, that means that we've come someplace in the, in the last 13 or 1400 years. But uh, and, and the other element about what you're talking about, um, you know, about the, the literal interpretation, to just take those as divine commands. I, I think it's also important to understand that most leaders uh, at that time were tyrants, local tyrant, you know, kings, et cetera. And they, they just said whatever they said, well, that's the law. It, it, it took a long time before the law uh, started to extract itself from the commands of the tyrants. Mm -hmm, uh, exactly. And to make it something more universal. And so this is, again, another universal human uh, problem that, that, exactly. uh, that each culture works its way out of. Exactly. Very right. And uh, actually, you're very right. But actually, in Islam, the Sharia remained as an independent source of law, uh, which sometimes balanced the tyrants, too. So that's an interesting mm -hmm. aspect of the Islamic tradition, which I think was a, you know, a great advance at the time. But, but you're very right to emphasize the role of tyrants, you know, despotic mm -hmm. regimes. And one thing I emphasize in the book again and again in different episodes is that uh, Islam was born to 7th century Arabia with Prophet Muhammad preaching monotheism and that's the core and, and ethics and worship. And I think these are the core values of the religion we Muslims have always preserved. Uh, but after Prophet Muhammad, there were also additional changes mm -hmm. because Islam became the religion of an empire. And that empire itself had interests, mm -hmm. which sometimes looked back into religion and mm -hmm. influenced it and manipulated it. Sometimes even 
introduce doctrines into it. Uh, one thing, for example, is the famous doctrine of abrogation. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but yes, yeah. uh, there are, when you read the Quran, they're very liberal, tolerant. I mean, they're very, let's say, pro-liberty uh, verses. I mean, saying no compulsion in religion, to you, your religion, to me, mine. There are verses to Prophet Muhammad saying uh, you're not a compeller over them. So it, these are the messages that liberal-minded Muslims quote, and I quote, you know, these are very right. powerful messages in the Quran. But there are some passages about fighting the unbelievers too, right? I mean, go and go and kill the, you know, polytheists and uh, the mushrikun and the, fir, the famous verse of the sword in, in the Surah Tawbah. Now, when you see these together, what kind of sense do you make out of this? Now, one way is to say, well, those ethical principles are universal, but at the same time, there were some battles too. Mm -hmm. Like just in the book of Joshua, there are some harsh passages in the Old Testament, yeah. but you know, that's not <laughs> what the Bible is telling us today. So that's one way of looking at that. The, let's say more enlightened way. But the other way of looking at that is the battle is the real thing. <laughs> Yeah. And that was actually introduced into Islamic law by the theory of abrogation, like the last verses abrogate the earlier ones and the violent verses, the belligerent verses, abrogate the verse of the sword. And I'm showing that with reference to scholars like Asmaf Sauruddin and others whose works are very important on this. I'm trying to bring all that together. Well, this happened because the Umayyad Empire wanted to expand. <laughs> right. They needed war and war was imperial policy at the time. So the theory of abrogation was uh, not a pious, I mean, it didn't come out of necessarily the religion itself. It came out of imperial politics. So there are other doctrines like that as well inserted into Islam, like predestination to make mm -hmm. people obedient to the tyrant, not really for the sake of religion itself. I, I like the way you, you uh, tied that to the, the basic idea, which is to not let the whimsical intellect you know, get involved in, 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 in just uh, adjusting things, whereas you have all these facts. This was really adjusted by the whimsical intellect. Oh, yeah. um, and then and then sealed and said, now you can't look at this one anymore. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there is among conservative Muslims today, there is this narrative that liberalism is all whimsical. You know, it's, it's about this, we all want to you know, justify human desire as if liberalism is all about people, you know, living hedonistic lives only. Right. Uh, some people might, but I mean, you can choose to live an ethical life. And I think that's the only way to live an ethical life if you're not coerced for it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> The thing is, uh, these doctor there are some hadiths also. I mean, I, very interesting. I mean, hadiths are, of course, sayings of Prophet Muhammad. And there are a lot of hadiths that give us wisdom and important. And without hadiths, we should not be able to understand the context of the Quran and so on and so forth. But there are a lot of forgeries <laughs> as hadiths do. <laughs> and the classical Sunni tradition says, well, our great scholars figured out which ones are the right ones and the wrong ones. And the Sahih ones are established in these collections. So two big collections. Bukhari and Muslim, and uh, they're generally taken as almost 100% true, or maybe just a few questions, but mm -hmm. everything there is almost taken as uh, unaccepted, uh, as, as authentic. Well, I'm saying, really? Well, there's a hadith which says, even if the ruler takes your wealth and flogs your back, still obey the ruler. Yeah. Like, did really the Prophet Muhammad <laughs> say this? Or... <laughs> Some people at the hands of rulers, I mean, we already know that the Umayyad dynasty invented hadiths about predestination, mm -hmm. uh, believing in a fatalist view of God and, and life because mm -hmm. predestination led to obedience to the ruler. Right. So uh, in certain chapters in the book, I try to show these manipulations of the despotic powers of the time on Islamic theology. Uh, people sometimes remember that the Mutezilites, the rationalists, I sometimes, I mean, I often uh, agree mm -hmm. with, were upheld and their doctrine was imposed for a short time during the early Abbasid Caliphate. I'm against that. But then they forget that the dogmatic philosophy, that the anti-rationalist philosophy was was made the official view in Islam by state power. And because the alternative was considered as heretic. That's the Qadri creed that I speak about in the book, which many Muslims are not aware because the winners of history didn't write about their own <laughs> alternative. No, no. <laughs> so I, I, I kind of show this kind of undercurrent in early Islam where uh, what became the mainstream view on certain issues became the mainstream view, not because they were more true to the Quran or they were more 
uh, sound theologically, but they were politically more useful. And which means we can reconsider those issues without really abandoning our commitment to the core of the faith. Yeah, it's, I think it's a, a tool that, that, of course, reason comes up with, but it's still a tool for how to sort through all the historical um, accumulations on top of the original thing. And how do you sort out which one? Now, that one that you, you mentioned about, you know, whether he takes your stuff and flogs your back, you still have to obey him, is very clearly self-interested. And there's others that are a little bit more. But I, I think one of those principles that really helps is just to say any leader who uh, demands unquestioning obedience is highly questionable. Yeah. That's just, yeah. it's just, it's, it's, that's the way it is. They don't want anybody to question for good reason. And, and, the, and that, again, is another universal thing. It's done politically in different cultures. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not just a religious issue. It's a human issue. Mm-hmm. People want to dictate to everybody else. Um, and and the, the only way to do that is, is just, you know, insist on obedience. Um, and as you, you, I liked your comment just a little bit earlier, that you, you really only way to live an ethical life is to do it without coercion. Um, you, you, we can think all kinds of things about God and, and, and the, the ideas about God and everything, but it seems ridiculous that he'd be stupid enough to, to accept coerced uh, behavior as what he was looking for. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm, it just mm-hmm. doesn't make any sense that the behavior is, is, is what he was after instead of the thinking. Yeah, that exactly. Very right. Thank you. And, and that coercion idea is, uh, unfortunately, it's very strong in, in the Muslim mm-hmm. world today. For example, Ramadan is coming in a week and, you know, we mm-hmm. Muslims will begin fasting. Most of us, I mean, who can't you know, do it for health reasons or, of course, uh, aside. But and, and uh, I mean, it's great. It's a it's a great act of piety and, and you know, austerity. I mean, you just. Give your, you also deprive yourself from food and water so you understand the situation of people who can't find them and so on and so forth. So mm-hmm. Ramadan is a very cherished uh, wor- act of worship and culture. But, I, and that's great, I love Ramadan, but I have a problem <laughs> mm-hmm. with Ramadan laws, mm-hmm. which are in practice in more than a dozen Muslim societies today, from Saudi Arabia to Pakistan to Malaysia. And the law is that. It's Ramadan time, so you're walking around and you drink a bottle of water or eat a sandwich. The police will be after you Mm -hmm. because you have to respect Ramadan. Well, am I fasting to please the police (laughs) or to please God? (laughs) Am I fasting to show off to the community how pious I am or is it Mm -hmm. really my personal devotion? So these things, and this is just one example, the idea that women should be forcefully covered, the idea... I mean, it's not that implemented anymore, but in classical texts uh, I show about hispa, about religious policing, uh, I mean, there are say, texts saying that if people don't worship on time, beat them with sticks, mm. which is not coming from the Quran. It is coming mm. from the cultures of those societies where uh, Christians were also using certain passages from the Bible to coerce their fate. I mean, uh, people will not forgot that, but there is... In the Gospel of Luke, there's a short passage which says, compel them to enter so my church will be full. This was Mm -hmm. used for centuries by the Catholics and even some Protestants uh, in early era to forcefully, you know, save people's souls. So we have those sort of approaches in in, in Islamic tradition. And I, I go through that and I show how actually it even doesn't necessarily come from the Quran and the prophet. Uh, Mm -hmm. For example, there's this term hispa, which is used for religious policing. And I show that actually, yes, the prophet established hispa and the first muhtasib, the one that hispa means, uh, I mean, it is used as religious policing. But when you look at the origin, it was a police prophet established in the Medina market to prevent fraud. There were Mm -hmm. fraudulent practices. They were peeling, selling grains with putting water into it, making it heavier. So Prophet mm-hmm. prevented to uh, try to prevent fraud because he was a merchant, so he knew how the market works, and you need some <laughs> market standards, right? But that evolved into religious policing, which you don't find in the very early descriptions of the practice. Mm-hmm. So this is one of the examples of uh, coercion. And today, the more you insist on this, what happens? You don't make people more pious. You make people hypocritical. Mm-hmm. Also, you make people feel unhappy with religion. And, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of people are becoming ex-Muslims or uh, deists. And in Turkey today, the talk of the day is a lot of youngsters are becoming deists. You know, they don't, which is very <laughs> enlightenment. You know, you can uh, relate to that. I, they believe in God, but no religion. <laughs> because, yeah, because they are fed up with uh, authoritarian, bigoted interpretations of religion that justifies power or 
demonizes minorities, gays, or other you know human beings. Mm-hmm. Well, this is a good thing, I think, to remember uh, for, for every institution that, that wants to impress this uh, and coerce other people to do something. Um, because a lot of people look back, I mean, one thing from history with uh, Islamic history is that a lot of people look back and say, boy, that was, must have been such a fundamental feeling uh, that, that inspired everybody to go out and, and conquer all that territory for Islam so quickly. And, and what they don't pay attention to, because maybe because of the religious angle it's put on, is that the reason that they were so successful is that the Byzantine Empire was was so intolerant of anybody else that it was yeah. easy for, to get the people to join anybody else. Yeah. 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 And so, so you're if you if you become an intolerant leader, you make it easy for your society to crumble. And if you if, if you if you do it the other way. It's hard to make your society crumble. You know, it's, it's really, yeah. People forget that, but uh, yeah. it's interesting that Islamic conquest, again, I'm critical of the idea of conquest in the name of religion per se, but also I see it's a fact of history. It happened and right. you, there were no better alternative probably at the time. If people don't know that Islamic conquests in, Fre- in Spain, for example, and in the Ottoman uh, territories too, what became the Ottoman Jews, they were welcomed by Jews mm-hmm. <laughs> who were fed up with the oppressive Christians of the time. And the Ottoman or the you know, Islamic model uh, came as a more tolerant and pluralistic way. So there is no civilization that is inherently enlightened or Mm-hmm. inherently more tolerant. And I think as a Muslim, I'm proud of the earliest centuries of my civilization and its contributions to world history mm-hmm. uh, to, and, and, and the protection it gave to minorities. But I am not happy with the current state of affairs in, in, in my own civilization. And what happened, you, I mean, you pointed a very, you pointed out a very good uh, uh, insight, George. Civilizations become more open-minded when they're powerful and when they're successful. Mm-hmm. Now, when you are unsuccessful, when you feel insecure, you get into this vicious cycle of being intolerant and closed-minded because you're weak, but then you become more weak. And it just yeah. went, goes down like that, which is exactly what happened, uh, I think, in the Muslim world in the past two centuries. Uh, Armenians in Turkey were wiped out through a genocide in 1915 mm-hmm. uh, because Turks became so insecure. Before that, mm-hmm. Turks and Armenians lived together for five centuries in the Ottoman Empire. Mm-hmm. The, the Jews in the Middle East have been destroyed to a great extent, Jewish communities. They had to flee to Israel and the West. But they were there for 13 centuries before that. And mm-hmm. the insecurity in the Muslim world led to illiberalism, authoritarianism, and hate, and revenge. And, but this vicious cycle has to be broken. Otherwise, it will just eat itself alive. And of course, uh, this story presents lessons to other civilizations, too. I mean, I'm seeing some of the troubling signs I'm familiar from the Middle East in America these days. Mm -hmm. I see how conspiracy theory has become a dominant theme in American politics. And I'm saying, oh, boy, I know what what this is and I know where this goes. This -hmm. doesn't go well. I mean, we already saw that, you know, in the past couple of months. And it leads to violence. It leads to hatred and so on and so forth. So I think no civilization is... Uh, inherently, you know, uh, enlightened. Uh, there are lessons to learn. I think as a Muslim, we have issues to sort out, but, that, but that's why I wrote this book. We also have insights that we can use to advance liberty and toleration. Uh, and I think our story, because I do, I go back and forth a lot between, you know, Christian and, and the Islamic traditions in the book. I mean, I show this insight by the Murgia, which was about toleration, is very similar to John Locke, you know, what he was saying. Right. Or Nathan, uh, the Rings of Nathan the Wise, that's a very important story in European Enlightenment, has interesting echoes with the, you know, Murgia doctrine. Uh, yeah, why don't you tell that story? That, that's very interesting. I, okay. I like it. Yeah. yeah, I thought that was great. Okay, uh, well, there is a school in early Islam that I also emphasize a lot. They were called murjia, uh, mm-hmm. which in Arabic means postponers, post- mm-hmm. because they did, po- what was postponing? They emerged at a time when the proto-Sunnis and the proto-Shiites, I call them proto because Sunni and Shiite tradition had not yet appeared, but ultimately it would go there, were mm-hmm. fighting over who was the right caliph, Ali or Uthman and Muawiyah. So they were, Muawiyah was Ali's opponent. So during this war, there was a lot of, you know, blaming the other side for heresy and kufr, and there were even a fanatic group which wanted to kill everybody. This was a big crisis. 
And the postponers, the Murgiites came to the scene and saying that, listen, we don't know which one is absolutely right or which one is the right Muslim, but we will postpone this to afterlife to be resolved by God. Right. So they said, let's just live and let live, mm -hmm. which actually helps mitigate that early tension in Islam. But it was, again, not cultivated enough. And uh, it's not an accident today. Groups like Al Qaeda or ISIS hate it, postponement. Right, right, and right. I show how in <laughs> ISIS documents, magazines, this is shown as the greatest heresy in the history of Islam. They say this is heresy because this is liberal. It says, right. You're not going to kill people because for their heretics. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's the doctrine says, which is important. And I show how, for example, that same insight is reflected. I mean, I don't think he got it from there in the great story yeah. of Nathan, uh, Nathan the Wise mm -hmm. uh, of Lessing. You know, there, there are three rings. Uh, I mean, three, three religions are like three rings. You don't know which one is true, but, you know, everybody wears one and they ultimately wait for God to solve it in the afterlife. Right. So until the afterlife, we just hang around and tolerate each other. Uh, so good and bad ideas, I think, emerge in different traditions independently some, or sometimes with some interactions. And I try to highlight some of those interesting uh, parallels in, 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 in the history of Christendom and, and, and Islam. And you, you, you also mentioned uh, another idea, which was uh, that there's a kind of competition in the early uh, Medina um, uh, parts of the Quran, but almost a like competition between uh, the religions. That everybody does their thing, um, and that that will lead to something better, which obviously uh, got oh. abrogated, right? That's a beautiful verse in Surah al maidah which says, God has given you different paths. If he willed, he would have made you one community. And he's mm -hmm. speaking of Jews and Christians and Muslims. He says, compete with each other doing good. Right. So we're not all Jews. We're not all Christians. We're not all Muslims. We're not all Ahmadis or Baha'is. By the way, I mean, Muslims will tolerate Jews and Christians, but they will say, but not the heretics. <laughs> right. <laughs> so let's tolerate everybody, even the people we see as heretics. And let's compete in doing good, which means everybody can do good. It's not just mm -hmm. our, our community, which is also interesting. And let's leave it to God. And that is a theological doctrine of freedom and, and liberalism. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised by some Muslims who think liberalism or liberty or human rights are just secular, godless ideas. No, mm -hmm. I mean, of course, atheists and deists or secular people can arrive at these ideas from their mm -hmm. conscience and intuition. But our religious freedom, religious traditions can arrive at, at them as well. And I show how much potential actually we had that for uh, in our own Islamic tradition. You think there's any chance that you could you could create a competition between all the different uh, Islamic sects to try to outdo each other at women's rights in a way to to try to move all of them forward? Because that would be a, a, a nice uh, method. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Unfortunately, they try to outdo each other in some not nice ways in some parts of the Muslim world today in Iraq and Syria. Unfortunately, through violence yeah. and a lot of er, er, oppression. And you go to Iran and you hear about Sunni minority being oppressed in Iran, and you go to Saudi Arabia. Of course, the Shiites are oppressed, and you go to mm -hmm. Pakistan and. Uh, this time the Sunnis are again, and then the, it's, uh, but there must be an end to this. And I think there mm -hmm. will be an end to this when we say, yes, we have a problem here, but we can sort this out without betraying who we are. And not to please the Westerners. I mean, that's, that's a big obsession. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we speak about these ideas, which sound like Western freedom and tolerance, oh, mm -hmm. we will all be helping some imperialist policy or so. No, this is to live in together in peace. And we already had the roots of that in our tradition. That's why I'm saying let's return to reason, freedom, and tolerance. Yeah, it's um, as I said, that's a, yet another cultural stream that has been going on, uh, at least uh, even even past ancient Greece, but but they really emphasize it um, and has influenced all cultures along with the other cultures influencing each other. And people aren't aware of how much interaction there was even three, four thousand years ago. Yeah. But but. Uh, I think the only thing that could probably bring everybody together in an immediate way would be, you know, as they do in the movies from Hollywood, some alien race comes from another planet and tries to eat us all. And so we all, we all, we gotta, we gotta get together right now. Yeah. We don't really, we don't really need that actually to, to do this, but uh, it seems like it's sometime. <laughs> or we can use reason and reasonableness to arrive yes. at that point without the aliens. <laughs> we and, we know, can we're all working for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, 
tell, I mean, part of the boldness of even talking about that reason is useful, um, is the history that you relate of so many reasonable people who presented even a very small portion of that. And, and of course, it was shut down and, and for political reasons and everything. But I think among all those stories, which I think people will find interesting in the book, um, I think you can talk a little bit about the, the, the Spanish um, Islamic philosophers who then influenced the Jewish philosophers who then influenced mm -hmm. the Enlightenment, mm -hmm. because I think it's a very interesting story that people should know. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, actually, a chapter of my book is devoted to Ibn Rushd. Actually, there are two interesting chapters that are related. I mean, one mm -hmm. is, the, and, I, and recently I wrote a New York Times article, you know, touching upon these issues. One is uh, the first chapter, Hai Ibn Yaksan, you know, a self-made man. And uh, th th there's this novel written by Ibn Tufail, who was an Aristotelian philosopher in Muslim Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, he has several works on astronomy, and, but his most famous work was this novel, which is known as the world's first philosophical novel. I mean, we know Orwell's 1984, right? I mean, mm -hmm. big but this was the first ever uh, a philosophical novel, at, at least as far as we know. Um, and he, the novel is about this lone man, lone baby coming alone to life on an island. I mean, we don't know how he came to life. The, maybe the mother put it in a, like a basket like Moses or he came to <laughs> life spontaneously. That's not clear in the novel. But he comes to life alone on an island and grows up. A, a gazelle adopts him and suckles him. So that's mm -hmm. mother the roe. That's the mother of the child. Mm -hmm. uh, so he grows up at seeing animals. One day the gazelle dies. He's at age, young age, child age. And he's, of course, devastated, and he wants to bring the gazelle back to life. And he does what was a taboo in the Middle Ages, which is uh, dissecting him and, you know, opening the body and seeing, mm -hmm. seeing the anatomy. And uh, through that, he, the little baby learns how the heart and the wanes and the body works, and then mm -hmm. looks at himself, and he gets interested in biology of animals. Mm -hmm. And then that leads to physics, and that leads to astronomy. So he just, he becomes a self-thought philosopher over time. And most interestingly, he develops a sense of ethics. He becomes an ethical person. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he, he becomes vegetarian. He doesn't want to hurt the animals. Mm -hmm. He also, uh, when he eats plants, you know, he preserves their seeds to preserve them. So he's become also very uh, mm -hmm. interested in preserving nature, right? I mean, uh, the global warming wasn't there at the time, but you know, he cares about <laughs> nature, let's say. And uh, so this self-thought philosopher, also he thinks about there must be a God. So he becomes a believer in God too, but mm -hmm. uh, actually he's a nover and not a believer. So that's a very interesting thing. So he, he rationally, he arrives at theology and, mm -hmm. but he says, he entertains the idea whether universe was preexistent or it was, it had a prime mover, it was eternal. So all these Greek ideas are out there and ultimately he becomes a mature, wise, moral person without a scripture, <laughs> mm -hmm. without a prophet, without a cleric educating him. Mm -hmm. And again, probably that's not going to happen. I mean, this is idealism. Really, you know? <laughs> but it, it is telling that there is something in human nature, in human conscience about discovering the world and developing ethical ideas. Now, this runs contrary to the Asharite theology, which was dominant at the time, which says, Outside of revelation, there is no ethical value. No, this is saying there is, there can be ethical value outside of revelation. Now, uh, Ibn Tufay wrote this, and Ibn Tufay's student or protege was an even greater philosopher, Ibn Rushd. Mm -hmm. now, known famous in the West as Averroes. He's famous because he was the one who wrote this massive commentary on the works of Aristotle. Mm -hmm. from which Europeans learned Aristotle. I mean, if there was no Ibn Rushd, probably Aristotle would not arrive into Europe anytime you know, soon. Right. Uh, Thomas Aquinas read from him the Avaro. There's this movement of Averroists in uh, 12th, 13th century in Paris and a reaction against them and so on and so forth. So he introduced Aristotle, which is the you know, foundation of method, like scientific method, you can call it. So... Also, though, Ibn Rushd is interesting, and that's known. Ibn Rushd is also interesting, though, because he was also a judge and jurist. He was a qadi. He was like, he was interpreting the Islamic Sharia. Mm -hmm. And uh, in most issues, he was traditional, but there are some insights of his 
that are in his commentaries that I recently highlighted and highlighted recently by a few scholars whose works I really admire, like Karen Talifiero, Ferry Al-Boha. And they show that Ibn Rushd wrote certain things which are very interesting, which reflects his universalism. For example, mm -hmm. in one passage, he writes, there are written laws, which is the Sharia, <laughs> mm -hmm. but he says there are also unwritten laws inherent in human nature, like mm -hmm. thankfulness, like mercy, like justice. And he says, there might be a tension between the two. And when it happens, he says, we will interpret the written laws. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if, if you see something in the Sharia that goes against justice, you should say, wait a minute, you know, this can't be this way. So mm -hmm. you'll look into it. And there are a few examples, actually. He actually called for, for example, there was an amputate, there was a theft case, there somebody's hand would be amputated, but he argues for hilm and gentleness and he argues against that. So mm -hmm. we have even a few examples of how he used that approach. He has very feminist views for contemporary, for contemporary uh, Muslims. On that, he was not inspired by Aristotle, whose ideas on women were not great, but right. Plato, luckily. So Plato had uh, emphasized the equal intellectual capacities of women and he embraced that and he has quite feminist views, I mean, for his time. Uh, and so he's, he's the perfect example showing that one can be loyal to the religious tradition, but also believe in universal wisdom can benefit from other civilizations and their contributions. In that case, it was the Greeks. Today, it could be anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and have this dynamic interpretation of the Sharia. Uh, unfortunately, Ibn Rushd huge legacy didn't become influential enough in the Muslim world. Actually, mm -hmm. he himself, I mean, I, I said recently he was canceled in the sense yeah. <laughs> that he himself was attacked. I mean, uh, Ashar, some strict Asharites in his town, Cordoba, found a pretext. Uh, he quoted a, a Greek philosopher who was worshiping Venus that was shown as he is worshiping Venus. So he's a polytheist. He was publicly humiliated. He was sentenced to house prison. He was banished to a small town. Uh, some of his books were burned. Mm -hmm. And we have those books, not in the Arabic originals, but in Hebrew and Latin translations that actually survived uh, in the European tradition. So I want to hear more about that. But before you do that, you mentioned canceled. It sounds, especially his punishment was because he had quoted somebody who had this issue. Not that he had the issue. It sounds like, you know, somebody getting canceled for having watched a Woody Allen movie or something like that. You know, it's like not not himself having done anything. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Uh, Guilt by association. Very familiar. Yeah. Very familiar. Very familiar. Yeah, very uh, familiar. Uh, again, yeah. these troubling yeah. dynamics emerge again and again in human yeah. history and yeah. sometimes today as well. Nobody uh, so, should feel that they just invented this kind of cancellation culture. It's, it's not a new invention at all. It's not a new invention. And at, the, at those times, it was harsher. But, you know, it can yeah. be harsh again, right? <laughs> it's, you should be careful. Uh, in my oh, country, in Turkey, there are very harsh versions of that. But, you know, I don't want to get, in, get into that as well. I yeah. mean, free speech is not a very popular idea in various parts of the Muslim world, uh, of the world today. I mean, yeah. anyway, so Ibn Rush's insight was interesting. Um, there is a... There was another interesting philosopher, jurist, scholar in uh, Cordoba, a contemporary of Ibn Rushd, who had a similar vision. Mm -hmm. uh, he was not Muslim, he was Jewish. He was the great Maimonides. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I, in the book, I show how Maimonides became more mainstream in Judaism and ultimately how his philosophical approach influenced the Haskalah, Jewish Enlightenment, Mm -hmm. uh, figures like Moses Mendelssohn, who's been called the John Locke of the Jews, you know, in the in the 18th right. century, and 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 there's something there that we should look into and and discover. And I I, I tried to show what exactly is in there, and that mm -hmm. was I think belief in universalism, belief in natural laws, that you know, because that one of the aspects of Asharism was that uh, the Asharites, the conservatives that I'm often criticizing here denied also that there is a causality in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it goes completely against the Aristotelian you know, way of the world. Mm -hmm. They said, there's no causality. God is recreating every instance without any, uh, without any causal link, mm -hmm. uh, which Leibniz would later criticize as a belief in perpetual miracles. And even John Locke would criticize that in, right. in the Western tradition. It so requires, these ideas- it, so, Yeah, it requires that, that the world is recreated every 
second as if there's a, a, an instant of time and, and it's like a movie that there's 32 frames per second yeah. and at each time the frame, but that's not the way things work, at yeah, least yeah. according to science, but that's what that's based on. This, this goes back to the dilemma, uh, the original dilemma again, because you're saying um, if you believe that, then you're saying whatever is created is, is, is pious and therefore it's what, it's what is, uh, God does. That's what it is that he likes. It's mm -hmm. not any particular standards or motives. I, I, I always think of motives. I mean, to me, it would be the motives of why you do what you do that most of the world is fairly neutral about what you do, but the motives for what you do is what gives it all of its um, qualitative value. Yeah, that is true. That's true. And um, it, it, it's called uh, occasionalism. You know, God creates these occasions yeah. in which there is no causal link. Now, it's a long discussion whether this had an impact on the approach to sciences in Islam. And I do mm -hmm. think there was. And I mm -hmm. looked into that with some scholarly views right. who are experts on this. But ultimately, it comes to this. I mean, all this is brought as the glorification of God, right? I mean, we don't want to accept anything besides his revelation and his power and everything. Mm -hmm. But, and I, I, as a believer, I respect any perspective that glorifies God. I myself glorify God. But I, what I see there is that it all, it is also, it does it in such a way it debases humanity too much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it debases human dignity. We humans cannot know anything. We humans cannot figure out the laws of the, the universe itself is nothing. It's just mere shadows. Now, when you go into that route, I think uh, at the expense of an over emphasis on God's greatness, you start to give up other values, God's justice uh, mm -hmm. and God's mercy to humans and the dignity has bestowed on humans. Uh, I, there's an even discussion about uh, among some theologians that whether this was opted in, in medieval Islam, because still it again helped the rulers because mm -hmm. a overpowerful and omnipotent God who cannot be questioned and understood in any way also helps a ruler who is a bit like that. Yeah. So yeah, again, what is presented as piety might have some other motives behind that. And, I mean, that's one ar argument that I entertain in the book. Yeah, we, we, we set aside the divine right of kings. That, that's been argued forever. And uh, at least that, that has been shuttled aside without, without really damaging the religion. It also, the other, if you turn it around, you know, the idea that God would create us as just total slaves would mean that there's no reason for free will. Um, you know, and, and it also means that it's his character. I mean, I, I think it's much more interesting to have faith that God's character is, is noble uh, than even to have faith that he exists, that he exists. You mm -hmm. know, if you say whether he exists or not, if he does exist, he has to be noble. Uh, yeah. Seems to me to be uh, a better basis for saying, well, what he's done for us is try to give us ideas about how to live life or whatever, mm -hmm. and not that this is going to make a big difference in his life. Mm -hmm. it, it takes away from him if everything that we do brings him down, right? It's theological absolutism, yeah. uh, as they call it, which... Uh, which makes everything collapse into the will of God, which I don't, as you say, don't believe even honors God. <laughs> right. It's, it is his mercy to give us dignity. I mean, there are verses in the Quran. God says God created, God will create a caliph on earth. And, and that's, yeah. by the way, not a caliph as a political ruler. That's a right. vicegerent of God. On, so God's representative. In the Bible, it's God created a man in his image, you don't have that in the Quran, but you have this idea that God, human beings represent God on earth, which means they have some wisdom, which means mm -hmm. they have some ethical knowledge, which means they can be high binyaksa and they can discover through and, you know, establish a morality and learn from religion, but also have religion and reason at the same time. And through reason, they can open up to global uh, universal human culture. Uh, I think the downplaying of that in uh, in late medieval Islam had bad consequences for the Muslim world, which mm -hmm. I think are still with us. And I think that's why a big reopening of minds is needed. Mm -hmm. But as you well point out, uh, no tradition is immune to these problems and they can come up in secular forms as well. And it's tough because we have a culture, as I said before, the cancel culture or anything even in that direction that says if somebody has been less than perfect, uh, they, they, they really had nothing to say. It's another element of it. And yeah. if you can, we really can't deal with America 
without dealing with the slavery, you know, issue. And that's a yeah, terrible yeah. thing, but that doesn't yeah. mean that America and the experiment was useless because yeah, yeah. slavery was universal. Now we had a yeah. terrible version of it, you know, and, and, and it still has impacts in the political. I mean, that, that's a, another totally long history to talk about, but the same thing, I think uh, people can, can understand the Muslim culture and their way they're reacting now based on the colonial uh, history that they were reacting to as well. And maybe you can talk a little bit about that as an influence on, on the absolutism being more popular than maybe it has been in the past in, in reaction to that. In reaction to a colonialism? Colonialism, yeah. Yeah, I mean, colonialism has been terrible for the Muslim world for two reasons, because of the first, the destruction itself brought. I mean, mm -hmm. the, in Algeria, you see how so many people being slaughtered because they mm -hmm. resist the colonial rule. Uh, but but on top of that, because of the reactionary and paranoid political culture it brought. Mm -hmm. Now, even colonialism is gone. If you speak about human rights, someone will say this is a colonial project and they will kill right. it. So mm -hmm. it is also, I mean, it was a bad, terrible experience. We, sh we should keep criticizing and we should ask for colonial powers to be more... Uh, uh, show some remorse and, you know, show some regret about their, I mean, I don't see that in mm. France, for example, today, which, which should yeah. happen. But on the other hand, it also, today look at Iran, I mean, the Iranian regime. Mm -hmm. If you speak about human rights in Iran, you become a colonial spy agent of CIA or something, which, right, is, right, right, which right. is also how that anti-colonial understandable reaction is cashed into authoritarian language. So that is the other problem that, that is being uh, used, I think. And also, we Muslims should see that colonialism was terrible. We have a right to denounce that. But we also created an empire from Spain to India. And right. a lot of people have bad memories about that as well. So yeah. it's yeah. not just one civilization that, I mean, the West did it more recently and with more arms and maybe more mm -hmm. efficiency and brutality. I mean, the colonial experience. But, uh, I mean, if you look at uh, liberated people <laughs> right. in the Balkans or, uh, or India, you know, they will not be happy with what happened. Uh, so it's, well, it's, it's a human history. A human history. And, and uh, again, this stream of reason that, and tolerance. Um, one of the things that's great about it is that you can show how it works better to achieve the same goals that were attempted in this other way. If you... They talk about something totally different, like Cuba. So Cuba was communist. So the United States, you know, put on, uh, you know, uh, blockades against it and, and, and gave it a hard time the whole time for 50 years. I think if they hadn't given it a hard time, uh, Castro would have been out in 10 years. Mm -hmm. You know, but, but by giving him a reason, the reason everything is so bad is that the, this big, our big neighbor is doing this to us. You know, you, 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 there's no patience. It's like there's no patience for people to move from where they are to another stage. And without that patience, there, there is no success in human culture because you, you, people just don't change overnight. You know, just... They don't. And uh, today I see people in Western societies saying that, you know, oh, Muslims are, you know, by nature, inherently illiberal authoritarian, you know, they're worried about mm -hmm. Muslim immigration and so on and so forth. Uh, I would, I mean, I would tell them, go read John Locke a little bit and see where you came from. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are enlightenment thinkers who look to the Ottoman Empire as an example, saying that, mm -hmm. uh, oh, the Turks, the empire of the Turks allows more religious freedom. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but yeah. uh, they allow men to live according to their conscience. It wasn't easy. I mean, look at, look at Nazism. Look, I mean, look at nationalist wars in Europe. I mean, Europe became a liberal continent only in after a second world war mm -hmm. before that religious wars, nationalism, fascism. So it's not easy to sustain a diverse culture with rule of law toleration. Um, and uh, wherever we find it, we have to preserve it. And wherever we don't have it, we have to work for it mm -hmm. uh, because people, I mean, I think I'm, I'm somebody who believes in the good qualities of human nature, but obviously there is, there are bad, bad instincts as well. And mm -hmm. to hate the other, hate one that is different, that is religiously, linguistically, racially different. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there are certain, uh, there are certain secrets of the progress civilization. That is one is freedom of speech where right. you can, where you, you don't silence ideas, but you engage with them. Mm -hmm. The other one is rule of law. So people can be secure in, you know, achieving their livelihood and so on and so forth. 
Uh, the other one is cosmopolitanism, openness, and toleration. I mean, what has made America so great? Mm -hmm. uh, people say, let's America make great. Well, America is great because so many cultures came into it and brought their mm -hmm. best of it. And, and that diversity is, is, is worth preserving, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm new in America. I'm still learning things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I see a lot of great things about its founding principles and its constitution. Mm -hmm. And I think there are really great things to preserve. I see the dark history of uh, slavery. I mean, that's, that's yeah. no minor thing. But as you say, I think uh, in any culture, the problems should be highlighted, but also the blessings and the contributions should not be forgotten. And, and a lot of people escape to America to uh, flee from religious persecution. So for those people, America was a, uh, was a land of liberty. For, for me and for a lot of people in the Middle East today, too, I mean, you come to a country where you're free. You know that you know, the police won't be at your door because what you said, something critical about somebody in power. Yeah, I think it's an, another thing that's important to know about America as we feel like we, we did something right by, by doing this with the immigration is that the people who uh, immigrated to America were the boldest people, the ones that had the most courage to get up from their own place and go someplace else. Not everybody, of course, mm -hmm. but on average. And so to ask everybody, oh, everybody can do this. No, no, everybody is not so bold as the people who got up and went to a country where they didn't speak the language, didn't, but they were willing to give it a try, either out of desperation, some of them, but also yeah. out of boldness for others. And, you know, that makes a big difference because we're talking about the whole planet, if we're talking about the future of human culture and, and, and all these major cultures getting together. And uh, this, this process, like you said, of saying what it is that made it work, you know, mm -hmm. rule of law, tolerance, uh, reason. Um, it doesn't mean that everything has to change. Uh, one of this is just an aside, but you know, some of my European friends worried about becoming too homogenized in Europe because of the European union. This was maybe 20, 30 years ago. Um, they said, well, you know, we don't want to become like America where everything is McDonald's, you know, and every, every, everything is all homogenous. I said, if you're worried about homogeneity with culture, just go to New Orleans and then go to Chicago. So yeah, New yeah. Orleans has been part of America for 200 years. So has Chicago. You'll, you'll find there'll still be a difference between Frankfurt and Paris 500 years from now, no matter how united you get. And I think if people just realize that, that you don't have to change the rituals you, but the principles are the thing that can unite us. Um, mm -hmm. But that's exactly the opposite of what people do, right? People want the rituals to prove that they're part of the group. Um, mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. that's what they, they hang with. Um, and, and, and growth of doctrine. I mean, I, I think yeah. in all our great religious traditions, there are powerful doctrines that are revolutionary in a good way in the world mm -hmm. history. Uh, I mean, America's founding, all men are created equal. That's a powerful mm -hmm. sentence. Not everybody believed in that. Now, right. the people who said that didn't fully realize that we see it very clearly today. Yeah, but right. still, by referring to that principle, Martin Luther King was, you know, uh, able to, you know, call America to its own founding principles. And today, I mean, I refer to the Quranic principle, la ikra fi din, no compulsion in religion, which was an mm -hmm. amazing statement in, in the middle of the seventh century to say, hey, listen, we have this statement, but we haven't really lived up to it. Yeah. Uh, so that's why we edited or abrogated, but we should <laughs> stop doing that and, you know, allow people to be Muslims out of their free conscience. And that's why I wanted to end with one last thing, because you said that the five keys, you know, that, that the Muslim have, the fifth one is intellect, right? Oh, so, yeah, yeah. P protection so, of the sh of Sharia, the intentions of the Sharia. Yes, intentions, yeah. And so, and so if that's true, you can say, well, what about that? How much attention have we been putting on that one? That's one of our five keys. That was one we should pay more attention to. Exactly. And, and the protection of intellect is one of the intentions of the Sharia. Of course, traditional clergy understand this only as banning alcohol, <laughs> so yeah, again, yeah. <laughs> pre preserving people from getting drunk. But if protection of the intellect is uh, the goal, probably there's more to do with free speech and uh, rule of law and uh, saving people from getting just one line of propaganda, which is very important to op freeing, freeing up the intellect. Oh, we're going to reinterpret it. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you very much. That was really a great discussion, a great book. Um, and I, I hope that the principles uh, seep into society so that they, they have their influence. Inshallah, as we say. Thank you so much, George. It was a great discussion. I enjoyed it very much. And thanks for Me too. This. And so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 118th or 19th year of discussion. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. And we hope to see you again soon. <laughs>